everybody. Thank you so much for joining us here. We are live on Facebook, GMI Hub, and tonight is going to be a really interesting topic. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, music in the church and worship and maybe writing songs for the congregational worship. Uh, my name is Dale Borland. And I'm Cheryl Duick, and with us we have Dave Severns. Dave Severns is a singer, a songwriter, and a worship leader at Compass Point Bible Church. I keep saying, I want to say that correctly, out in Burlington, Ontario. Dave, welcome, and thank you for being here. Thank you. It's a pleasure. It's great to have you, Dave. We have a couple of questions we want to throw at you because there may be people out there that are uh, maybe in the church in some capacity, and they're maybe a songwriter, maybe themselves. Uh, so if, if you're a songwriter in a church, do you think there's a possibility for them to be utilized? And uh, what, what would be the purpose uh, for the church to maybe cultivate that type of thing in their church? Oh, man, I think songwriting in the church is so useful and such a great way to bless your church, to give your church a voice uh, and to, to praise God. Um, it's interesting. The Bible talks a, a fair amount in the Psalms about singing a new song. We kind of get this implication that we sing old songs that we go back to the Psalms, but it actually, it talks somewhat regularly about singing a new song. Um, and I think being able to take ancient truths about who our God is and put them in words that are meaningful in your context to your people that are connected to you, that are connected to people who know each other is just such a blessing and such a great way for us to unify our hearts towards God. And what about you? Um, do you actually, are you involved in the process of introducing new songs and, um, what, what, what would that be like in the scenario? Let's say you have a new song and you want to present it to your congregation or to your band. Let's take us yeah. back up a bit more. To yeah. your band per se, what's a kind of the first step? Yeah, so uh, often, often when I'm writing for the church, um, I start by asking myself, what is it that we need to sing in this season? There are tons of great songs out there, but I mean, every church kind of picks a repertoire. And then often as the person who's picking music, if you're curating stuff, you find there are holes. Um, so I start there and I, I write something and then I bring it to some people I trust, usually some of our musicians, uh, a couple of our pastors, and I kind of play it for them and I say, what do you think? Um, does this speak to a truth? Does this resonate with you? Uh, and then if it resonates, usually I will um, introduce it to the congregation, usually in a way that invites people to listen along first uh, and to sing it when they're comfortable, but more in a performance way the first time. Uh, and then I'll repeat it again the next week and the next week and all through the way kind of check how's it going, see the feedback we get, um, make tweaks or kind of decide maybe this is a better performance song than a congregational song. Uh, but yeah, kind of just bringing it to the, the right power brokers along the way and, and seeing what God does with it. Now, first of all, you talked about doing a, a type of performance aspect. So mm. meaning that you perform the song to the point of where people can understand how the song goes. Yeah. Yeah, you know, chorus, verse, bridge, chorus, whatever. So you have that kind of, now do you find that there is a certain pattern uh, that works better in congregational worship uh, for uh, that sense of teaching is that you teach the, the, the chorus first and then you go back and, and do the verse or what's the best thing for to teach? Yeah, it, I think it depends. I mean, it is great. The chorus is kind of where the hook of the song should lie and kind of the main point of the song. So it's really important that you get that. Um, I mean, I've written plenty of mediocre songs in my days and songs that I'm like, this is great. And then I teach it and people are like, I really like that, that really hooky part. The, the end of the bridge. And I'm like, oh yeah, no, I should have should have written that better. Um, if you can't remember the chorus, that's probably a problem. Uh, so it's, it's good to teach the chorus first, uh, but again, it depends. And you can use different structures. Sometimes you write stuff that's a little more like a hymn with a refrain or just with a bunch of verses. Sometimes you write stuff that's, um, you know, classic verse, pre-chorus, chorus, verse, pre-chorus, chorus, bridge, bridge, chorus, chorus. Right, right. Um, and so it depends a little bit, but I, it is really helpful to be able to, to teach that. And also give, I, I find one of the things as a worship leader, giving people permission in a new song to learn it and saying like, you might not know this song yet, sing it as you get comfortable with it. Um, that that kind of gives people, it's okay if they don't know it. Where if you feel like you should know it, but you don't, you feel awkward. You don't like that. Um, so I think it's important in how you lead it and how you introduce it as well. Very Let's good. take this a little step back. Like, you, know, you you have quite an extensive background in in all of this. Can you tell us a little bit more about that or tell our audience a little bit more about your background in songwriting yeah. and all that? Sure. So I, uh, I started leading worship 20 years ago when I was 13. Uh, I was doing it for church youth group and ended up getting involved in Sunday morning a little bit, thanks to some great mentors and then that citywide worship stuff. Ended up doing my undergrad out at Briarcrest, where I took songwriting with Ken Dosso. 
uh, Ken, who'd been teaching there for a while, great, great songwriter, has been on uh, Juno and GMA panels, um, written, written a lot of choral stuff, actually, but written a lot of stuff for the church and co-written with a lot of great people. Um, and so did songwriting there, was involved with the touring group Elevate, uh, and then ended up going out to Lethbridge and working under Ken at the Euphrey Lethbridge Church for seven years. Uh, and that's where I, I went down to Nashville, did my first album there called Songs for Singing. And it was a song, uh, six songs written for the church. Um, and I'd been involved again with GMAs and involved in a songwriting contest, writing stuff actually for our youth teams. Um, managed to get it in the radio. It was really exciting for them to hear themselves on the radio. Awesome. Uh, and then, yeah, just kind of stuck with it. Uh, did My last project was actually part of my master's thesis out at Regent College. Um, and again, song, congregational songs written around the church calendar. Um, so I've served in a number of different churches on pastoral staff like I am now. Um, but yeah, writing, writing for the church, for the context, writing for, um, I love writing for, for where I'm at uh, and, and being able to give people a voice. Uh, and there's a funny thing about writing locally. Uh, you know, Chris Tomlin songs, Bethel songs, what, whatever, you know, resonates well. Those are great. They're always going to resonate well. But songs written in your context actually speak to people in a different and almost a more powerful way. And I found that. I've got songs that, frankly, I look back and I think that's, eh, that's probably a mediocre song. But people have really met God in them. Um, so there's just really cool stuff that's happened through my decades now of leading worship and writing songs for the church. <laughs> No, like the, the song, for instance, you have cut through the noise uh, yeah. background behind it. That what would that what was the presence of mind of thinking when you started with that basic basic song? Uh, yeah, so I was uh, we were going on a young adults retreat um, at that time and was looking for a song that kind of talked to this need for for silence and need for kind of clarity and uh, hearing God clearly through the chaos of everything going on. And I couldn't find it. I couldn't find a good song that I liked. So I sat down with my guitar and wrote it. And that was one of those rare songs that comes out in 20 minutes. Doesn't happen often. Uh, there was definitely a little bit of editing involved, but it just kind of came out really simple, really simple verse, really simple verse, no bridge. Um, and, I, you know, I brought it along on the retreat and thought, this will be great for a couple of sessions. And it just stuck. People loved it, ended up doing, uh, doing it as part of our ser Sunday night services, moved into our Sunday morning services, ended up on the local radio stations. Um, wow. Yeah, just kind of grew legs and, and still to this day there's churches singing it and I've I've led it and it's just been a yeah just a really simple song again uh, congregational stuff being able to sing it and approach it easily is important so that one just kind of grew legs and, and went and that's the thing about songs you never know what's going to happen with them you kind of offer yeah. them up and God's going to do what he's going to do amen that's so true now, later on, hopefully we'll be getting some questions online. So I just want to let everybody know, we are streaming live on Facebook. And if you have an, uh, a question or something you want to uh, throw Dave's way, or, or maybe the rest of us, we could, just, we could just talk and answer those questions for you live right here online. So please feel free to go to the chat section and talk a little bit and ask us some questions. We'd love to hear from you. Yeah. Um, as we're going on, the behind the songs, like we're talking about uh, Cut Through the Noise and you, uh, how that was coming to the place where you, it's just getting all that stuff out of, so you could focus. Um, what about uh, even when, you know, mm. the whole idea of even though this is happening? Yeah, so I mean, that one is based on uh, Romans Romans 8, I believe, the end of that, that chapter there, just talking about how the love of God is steadfast. Um, and again, that was written out of a very specific time and context. Um, there's actually... Uh, right at the end of my time at the church in Lethbridge and our lead pastor's wife, uh, Connie Lawson, who was just a wonderful lady also on the church staff, was suddenly diagnosed with uh, stage four cancer. Uh, really tough, really, really hard. And you notice lines in that song about bodies being weak and frail. Um, it comes out of that. It comes out of this, you know, I've, I've watched not only her, but lots of people battle with illness, battle with just tough circumstances. And this idea that God's love goes with us through those, even when things are really hard, nothing can break us from your love. Um, so again, that that song spoke really, really powerfully in that time and that season in our church because we as a community felt that, right? And churches go through seasons like that. There's there's unique things about every one of our contexts, and that's part of the blessing of the local church is that God is moving in unique ways in my church and in your church, and they look similar but different. Um, so you can write a song that will that speak well. Yeah. It's like a word fitly spoken, but it's a song fitly yeah. spoken, you know, like exactly. apples of gold and, and pictures of silver kind of thing. Yeah, huh? yeah very true. I found that very interesting what you said that as you, there's lots of songs that are out there that 
that people resonate with. But when you wrote specific songs locally, it really resonated in a very special way. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Like, like how, how it was it because of the people reacted or how, how did it how, how, explain that? <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, I, I think this, this is true of most art, actually. Um, if we think of people we know who are creators in any way, when we know them, when we have relationships, the things they create find new depth and new meaning because you, you know that person, you know what's behind their heart, you know some of the labors that went into it. And I've, I've experienced this with my own songs, but also we've, we've tried to build up some writers in our church. So a couple of, a couple of guys and I got together a couple Easter's ago and wrote an Easter song for our church. And the same, same kind of thing. Um, our church knowing that these two guys who had grown up in the church, whose families were at the church, were, were part of writing something to remind us of God's truth around Easter. That was really meaningful. Uh, people, you know, it wasn't just a, a good song, you know, like, a, like, again, a Bethel song or a Hillsong song, great songs, catchy, wonderful melody, wonderful truth. Love it. But the fact that these wonderful truths were born out of relationships and out of context and out of years of growth and gospel uh, in our context, there's something really significant about that, that people just love. And I, I think it, it pushes our own people to dive into their faith and to say, you know, maybe, maybe there's words that God has for me that I can offer to the church. And maybe it's not a song, but maybe it's a, a prayer or a poem or a painting or, or anything. So um, what about methodology? Do you yeah. have a method to make uh, to is like for, we we talked about other yeah. artists who do they write the song through the through the mu music first and then bring mm -hmm. the lyrics into play or do yeah. you have a theme and then work from how does it work for you yeah so i mean every time is a bit different um everyone's got a bit of a different methodology you're right uh i've i've found um i'm i'm a songwriter who who writes well with boundaries and i think a lot of us do this idea that we kind of write whatever you feel like can be almost debilitating and you can get nowhere pretty quickly. I really like walking into a songwriting session and, and habitually doing it and saying, okay, I don't know what I'm going to write today. So before I pick up the guitar, I'd like to write something that kind of feels like this around these themes. And then I, I usually write lyrics and melody at the same time, um, but also give myself lots of permission. There's a difference between the writing phase and the editing phase. And the editing phase is where a lot of the work comes in. Um, but you know, there's no bad ideas when you're writing, just get it out there. Sure, play the six chord. I can change it to the two later, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> um, so I kind of get that going. Uh, and again, for congregational stuff, I give myself a lot of like, I, I naturally write things that I like to sing or, or feel, but then I'm like, okay, what, what in our context, what's gonna resonate? What, what's gonna be easy? We've got a lot of uh, intergenerational families in our church, which we love, but I know that my generation and my kids are pretty quick at picking up syncopated rhythms. And a lot of our seniors really struggle with them. Yes. So I think, okay, if I'm gonna write this for our church, I probably need to be simpler. Um, and if I'm not gonna be able to give a recording of it first, it actually needs to be a level simpler so people can pick it up and sing it well. Mm -hmm. So I kind of go through some of those practices and I think, you know, if this, if this song has a range of an octave and a sixth, that's gonna be hard. Most people can't sing that. As a singer, as a musician, man, I love it. I love being able to belt stuff, but what's going to be the best range for our church? Okay, I'm going to bring it down. My top note's going to be a D. Yeah, I'd sound better at an F sharp, but I'm going to make it a D. Bottom note's a C or a B. Okay, that's manageable. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I give myself some of those confines. Kind of once I start editing, I say, can I pare it down a little bit? Can I make it simple? Now, it's easy to go too far and to make things too simple, um, to make things boring. Uh, it's the same with lyrics, right? You want... You want familiar, you want biblical, but you want fresh. Um, fresh without confusing and overwhelming, though. And that, that line in congregational writing is, is a tough one. Um, mm -hmm. You can easily do something that you're like, that's a really great line, but it's, it's probably a better performance line. Um, mm -hmm. One of the early songs I wrote with a guy named Ben Reynolds, great songwriter down in Nashville, Canadian guy, uh, song We Need You More, like the oceans of grain going, growing gold in the sun. Beautiful picture. I was living on the prairies then, if you can't tell. Um, worked really well in the prairies. Worked less well when I was in Vancouver. Um, and, and, you know, maybe that's a better performance line than a congregational line. Maybe not. But. Yeah. We had a conversation just a few weeks ago with Jason Dunn, a former yeah. vocalist, 
from uh, Hawk Nelson, and he he's working at a church now as a youth, uh, worship singer leader there. And he had the same type of thing, just bringing into what we're talking about. He uh, wrote a song, and, and he always has a sounding board with his pastor, mm -hmm. to his, his boss. So he was saying, this is a song, and I wanted to maybe present that to the church. And then they went through some of the, the, the lyrics, and he was able to, to soundboard the theology behind it. Mm -hmm. And because of that, there were some opportunities for Jason to make some revisions to the song. And I think that that's, how important is that to you? Hugely important. Um, I think, you know, you can have a beautiful song with a beautiful melody, but if it's got unhelpful things, if it says things about God that are untrue, things that lead us to idols instead of God, I think that's bad. It's really bad. <laughs> um, you know, we should, we should try to point to God. If worship is all about God, then, then we need to be right. Now you can take it overboard. Um, you can certainly, like, we need artistic license. I actually think a lot of our theology needs to be more informed by arts and by poetry. Um, I think if, you know, like, pastors need artists, artists need theologian pastors. Um, but I think we as a songwriters need to need to help hold that tension and to, if, if you're not a theologian, um, take it to people to who, who are. Read some theology books as well as songwriting books and creative books. Mm -hmm dig in, learn about the scriptures, learn about the background. I mean, I'm one of the reasons I went and did a master's degree in theology and arts is because I felt a burden that we need to keep good theology in our churches, in our songwriting, in, in our worship leading. Yeah. So I think it's hugely important. That's great. So that's how you arrive at a lyric that is going to work. And uh, so when you get a song, the phrasing, you know, you know, the, the, the rhythm and the timing, and sometimes it's like you said, you need to simplify it a little bit. Yeah. Um, uh, I guess it's it would have different uh, be different for you for a larger congregation than a smaller congregation, or is there, uh, you know, how do you find that that works? If you if you're in a like a Bible study with ten people, or if you're in a congregation over four hundred, is there some songs that work better? Or yeah, I mean, my my kind of litmus test of a good song is actually that it'll work in almost every context. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, that it'll work from from a small group of five people up to couple thousand at a conference mm -hmm. um, but there are some songs that lean one direction more than another and there's nothing wrong with that I think the simplicity thing and some of those like even ranges it's, there's been huge debates right Paul Balash used to say C to C and if you're into musical pedagogy that technically speaking is the best range for the most people um, but you know Chris Tomlin pushes way higher than that and he kind of says you get out of people what you ask from them mm -hmm. and I think I think it depends a little bit on your context, on what people are used to listening to, on how charismatic and how expressive people are. I mean, I, I work in Burlington and we're kind of a white middle-class church. We're, we're working on diversity and we love, you know, but that's who we are. That's our, our context. So we tend to be a little more uh, stuck on some of those things. We still, you know, we still sing a hymn almost every week. Love it. Yes. Uh, so it's a little harder for us. There are contexts I've been in where, range or melody you know if i'm leading youth even i'll i'll push harder into syncopated interesting rhythms um so it, it depends who are you leading and how can you serve them well is the, is the question i always ask myself and, and you have to know your people um you have to know who you're leading and that's exactly what i was just about to say i guess it does boil down to having to know your people know who your audience is yeah i love the fact that you said that um that I'm going back a few comments about right now that you mentor young people or other people to be songwriters. I, that I think is absolutely awesome because that's one of the things we we support here is a lot of is mentorship. And I love the fact that you wrote for Easter. So have you ever wrote a Christmas song? Yeah. Um, in fact, myself and a friend of mine, Jeff Knight, who's serving at uh, ooh, it's an Alliance Church. I want to say Whitby. I can't remember the name of it. But Jeff and I actually go back to Briarcrest days, but he and I uh, have written together every Christmas for the past three years and have plans. We'll see how this COVID stuff, but of actually doing a collaborative album with their church and our church. Uh, That's way, awesome. Uh, <laughs> what a winky dink. <laughs> but yeah, what a, like we love, love writing for that stuff. Now, some of our Christmas stuff is kind of funny and cheeky. I, I wrote a song. It's a performance song, not a congregational song called Presence, but spelled with a C. It kind of sounds like a drinking song. It's great. Um, but you know, this idea that we don't need more presents, more stuff, what we need is presents. We need like, yeah, it ends kind of with this manger scene. Um, but we've written some really great 
congregational songs. Uh, and, you know, Christmas is a weird one because we all, all churches seem to want to sing the same carols or, you know, maybe the, the Paul Balash renditions of those carols, which are great, love them, or the Hillsong renditions. Um, but you've only got four, maybe five weeks to sing this like beloved set of songs and finding ways to introduce them can be hard. Yeah. You write yeah. something for your church, people, again, people latch onto it quicker somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the reason why I asked is because it's one of the, pro one of the projects we put forth mm -hmm. um, to people of the hub is really just to start writing Christmas songs. And why? Because we want to, we want to produce a compilation Christmas CD. Awesome. So we're inviting, our, we're inviting writers, for those of you who don't know writers that are out there, get your Christmas songs ready. We are wanting to put forth, um, with your submissions, a Christmas compilation CD album. album. Yeah. Sorry, I'm not to say CD. I've been corrected <laughs> by the technical director here. No, CD, whatever. You know. Yeah. <laughs> a project. <laughs> that, really? I don't know. Because, because honestly, it's like you said, Dave, um, there's something special about, there's something special about writing something in a sense locally, or can I say nationally, if we can say in Canada, um, there's, there's a deeper meaning there because people can relate to it a little bit more. And I think there's some high quality music out there that's just kind of hiding under, I don't know, bed mattresses or something like that. And it's time for them to come out. It's yeah. time for them to come out. So um, if you have a song, you know, you better text us or, or message us here. <laughs> if you're interested in being part of the compilation, you have to go through an audition process. So. <laughs> I also just, no, just send say, your song. <laughs> if, if you're writing for the church, yeah. um, it's great to imagine and to pray for God to use it beyond your church. But if you write a song and you bless five, 10, 50, 100, 200, 500 people, whatever, your church with that song, like praise be to God. That is a great life for that song. And it doesn't need to live on forever. You don't need to become the next Chris Tomlin. Um, we're called to write. I, and I think like David in the Psalms, when he was writing, he was writing his journal, right? He was out in the fields. He wasn't writing for radio. He wasn't writing to get famous or to be on the next album. And those are the greatest songs we have. So like, hmm. Try write that. for your church and don't worry if it's not perfect bless your people with it they will be blessed now, let, let me let me just uh, tag on something a question that, that we brought up earlier if you could think of four main points that a worship leader needs to have to do their job and do their role what would they be the four things oh man this one's a good one um first of all i think you need to be a musician and we're talking about musical like leading people in songs, you need to have some musical chops, know your theory, know your instruments, know how to speak to other instrumentalists, super important. Um, second, you need to be able to lead people well uh, and, and lead people graciously. Uh, to, you know, read some leadership books, dig in, figure out how to, how to interact with people, know your personality, know their personalities. Often worship leaders, we're leading fellow artists and creatives and we aren't always the easiest people to lead, and that's okay, uh, but find ways <laughs> to lead them well. Um, third, it is really good to know technology. Uh, if you are blessed with someone in your context who knows technology well, who you can work alongside, great. But you will bless those people, you will bless your whole tech team by also knowing a bit about their world, by being able to understand and speak back to them some language, by knowing a bit about EQ and video compression and, yes. you know, Yes. Pixel density, whatever it is, that, that is huge. Uh, and then fourth, become a theologian. Know God, know the Bible, um, care about the words you choose. Uh, I, I think, you know, we, we as Levites, as pastors, it, it's, it's so important. And if you, don't, if you don't have the title of pastor, but you're leading people in song, you're, you're pastoring people, I think. Um, so, so care yeah. deeply about the words and how you lead people, about your prayers, about the songs you pick and what they're saying about who God is and who we are in, in reverse. Right. That's wonderful. Absolutely. For those of you just visiting with us right now or, or viewing right now, we are talking with Dave Severns, who is a singer, songwriter, and a worship leader at Compass Point Bible Church in Burlington, Ontario. Dave is just sharing with us some secrets related to uh, writing songs that engage people into praise and worship. Thank you so much, Dave, again, for being here. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, questions more questions that pop up um in your opinion you talked about songs being simple 
So let's let's kind of dissect some of these some some ways that songs can be simplified. Um, you mentioned Chris Tomlin, and uh, I right now I'm trying to remember the name of one of his songs, but um, he he made uh, he it, he he seems to make his songs simple by repeating the same chord structure over and over and over again. He may change the words, he may change the melody of the verse compared to the chorus, but it seems like the underlying um, chord structure remains the same all the way through. Do you find, do you use that technology or, or that methodology or do you find different ways to be simple? Uh, yeah, it, it depends. There, there's definitely like a fine line. I know, so as a young songwriter, um, as many of us in the church, you know, I liked John Mayer. John Mayer is all about like the jazz chords and like the flat seven, like so much fun. And I mean, I, I did jazz trumpet for a while. I love that stuff really fun as a musician, impresses other musicians, confuses people who aren't musicians. <laughs> <laughs> and especially if they have to try to sing that flat seven, like that's hard. Yeah. Um, now there's, you know, you can take it too far. Some stuff, one of the critiques leveled against worship music all the time is that it's too simple. Uh, yeah. And there, there is a fine line there. And you, again, it's, it's a little different in every context, um, but I think this idea of repetition uh, of taking melodies and developing them, of repeating things. It's been, it's been part of music for, for the ages, right? Like classical music does it, you, you kind of develop a melody. Um, so I, I think you can play stuff over the same chord progression. I mean, the, you know, the modern example, which isn't Chris Tomlin, but Waymaker, it's four chords over and over, same four chords, same order. Um, and that's, you know, it, it works for Waymaker. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying anything against it. And there's lots of songs that have different chords in them that also work. So there's no hard and fast rule, but if if you take it to a musician who's learning and they can't play it, that's gonna be a barrier for leading your people well in it. If people can't predict what's coming next to some extent, you want some surprise, some tension, but you also need some release. If the whole song is just tension and going confusing places, it's not a pleasant experience often, which works really well in some performance context, less well if we're asking people to engage and sing along. So let's get into that, maybe unpack it a bit more and talk about maybe three aspects of um, songs, in your opinion, that would work really well in, with, when you're writing a praise and worship song. Yeah, so um, first one, like, let, let's start with range. Range is, uh, is huge. If, you, if, if you're going all over the place, and not just like total range of the song, but also in, in your uh, jumps between things, your, your intervals, if you're jumping fifth, sixth, octaves often in your song great performance technique usually you can showcase your voice sounds awesome my parents can't sing that my kids won't sing that um and if if i'm trying to encourage people to sing along and sing praises to god and use these words as prayers to god i actually want them to be able to sing it i want to push them a little bit but i want them to be able to know that so i think thinking about range and thinking about how intervals work is important um, with that rhythms uh, and, and you can have complex rhythms, but the more complex they are, I find the better you are to repeat them more often. You can repeat the same rhythm with a different melody, which helps give it a fresh life. Um, often verses do that. You kind of have three of the same melody with the same rhythm. And then the last one is a different melody with a similar rhythm or the same rhythm. And it kind of just makes it feel a little different, adds the tension. Um, if your verse is a phrase that doesn't repeat anything melodically or rhythmic wise, it's going to be hard to follow. Um, and, and you want to like great litmus test of this, take a song, play it for someone once and say, can you sing back the melody of the chorus for me? And if they can, if they get it pretty close, not bad. Yeah, right, absolutely. Do it with someone who's not a great musician. Do it with your pastor who can barely sing. That's, actually, <laughs> that's the target audience, right? It's not, you don't, your worship team are the best musicians you have. I often tell my worship team and people outside of my worship team, you know, if you guys are sick of playing a song, if you feel like it's old, you're probably about ready to lead it. Yeah. You're the best yeah. musicians I know. You need to be practicing it. You need to know it well. You're going to serve our people so well. Yes, you're going to be sick of it. But it's not about you. It's about leading our people well. Yeah. That is um, so true. <laughs> Absolutely. That's well hard. And again, here, here. some churches are more musical than others. Yeah. And that's great. If you've got a you know, wonderfully musical church that loves complex rhythms, blessings do complex things. Mm -hmm. That's not mine. Um, so, you know, I work on that. 
So then what is your musical influences then? Uh, maybe back in the day when you first picked up the guitar. Yep. Um, you know, that Tim Hughes, Here I Am to Worship album was a huge mm -hmm. one on me. Yeah. Uh, loved that. There's lots of, I mean, yeah, John Mayer. I, I listen eclectically. So like I grew up listening to DC Talk. Jars of Clay is a huge one for me. Uh, Newsboys, the old Newsboys stuff. Um, but also listened to Thousand Foot Crutch and uh, gotten a mute math. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. Currently listening to, you know, love Ben Rector, love Rose Cousins, who's a great Canadian singer songwriter, not, not Christian. Um, I don't, I will, so I've been in the worship game for long enough doing worship music. I don't often listen to worship music for fun anymore. If I can say that a terrible thing to admit no no i, I understand though it, it's it's because it's your job right yeah I'll, I'll go and i'll listen through the new elevation church bethel hillsong records i'll pick out songs i like um i actually one of the things that's been really helpful in our church i cur curate two spotify playlists for our people mm -hmm. one is our most sung songs 30 songs that we sing kind of on high rotation people love that listen all the time and then one is our up and coming playlist songs that i think we might add at some point in the future I'm always looking for new stuff for those. And those are, those are great. And, you know, song goes from a up and coming song to a well-known song. Mm -hmm. Great teaching tool, helps some of our people learn more complex rhythms and melodies. Um, we, we learn these so much better when we hear them, even better than if you can read music, in fact. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I'll, I'll listen to just about anything. I mean, you know, some days it's Miles Davis, some days it's classical, some days it's Ben Rector, just depends. That is cool. Um, have you, so, so these musical influences have somehow worked their way into your music too, do you think? Or you, it's kind of a clec, a, a clec, check, is that the right word? <laughs> yeah, it, it definitely. There's definite, there's, you know, I think every songwriter has that moment when you're writing and you're like, oh, I found this great melody. And you let it sit for five minutes and you're like, no, I just ripped it off from that song that I love. Shoot. <laughs> <laughs> Back to the drawing board, right? And there's nothing wrong with it. We're all kind of curating things constantly and, and chewing them up and spitting them out. Um, yeah, so uh, how, how often do you find you, you do a song, maybe you, you've written one and, and it doesn't work? Uh, what, what's kind of the warning that you've learned from? You think, yeah, I, I shouldn't have done that. Or maybe yeah. there's some things people need to look for when they're writing that you don't want to do. Um, I think... If you, if you write a song and people's response is, what did that mean? Mm, yes, that's, nice. that's a good sign that you An indicator. Yeah. maybe need to go back and, and do a little bit of editing. And sometimes like, again, sometimes it's a really creative good line. This tension between fresh and like well-known and well-understood is a really significant tension. Um, there are beautiful poetic lines that I love, right? I mean, so many of the great songwriters, the Bob Dylans, the, you know, there's just tons of people, um, uh, James Taylors, who write stuff that's, and it's not vague, but it's like this beautiful poetic look at the world. Um, it tells a story, it gives these rich details. It's actually harder to do in worship music mm -hmm. sometimes. Um, because we're trying to sing in a different way. So finding new ways to say things without it becoming heretical in some ways or unhelpful, um, that's a tricky one. And I've met uh, often when you're starting out, when I was starting out, I wrote stuff that was either really generic and kind of like, well, yeah, I can string together a whole bunch of churchy phrases and write a decent melody, but it's not telling me anything new. It doesn't really speak to my heart. Or I can write something that's like brooding and complex and interesting to me, but like, I play it for my wife even, and she's like, what, what, what does that mean? And I'm like, oh, okay, back to the drawing board. I need to <laughs> tweak that one a bit. Well, yeah, it's funny, some of the old, oh, just, just the, some of the old hymns, mm. the ones that we, we yeah. grew up on, have the most deep theological and complex, compre you know, it's just yeah. flowery speech. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of songs to nowadays have stayed taking a step the opposite way, where they don't want to be, um, exploring those you know different comprehensions of words and stuff and make it more simple yeah and it again the the simpler you get you can kind of reach more people but also you can bore people um again one of the, the accusations leveled against ccm is that it's it's all the same it's all boring it's the same phrases repeated yeah. you know and 
So how do how do we do that? And I like I think there's also space for some of the complexities. I think you know just because transubstantiation is a confusing word doesn't mean we could never use it in a song. Absolutely. You'd have to be really careful. Mm -hmm. You probably want to explain it. But I mean, when I teach, uh, when I teach, when I play old hymns, Come Thou Fount, one of my favorite old hymns, um, it's confusing if you didn't grow up singing it and you don't know what an Ebenezer is and you don't know some of these other words. So I actually teach that like a new song when I, when I lead it. I say, this is what an Ebenezer is. This is why these, like, why we still sing these rich words. And I think we can do the same with new songs that we teach, especially songs we've written. We can say, this is some of the meaning behind this set of words. And that can be really helpful. If you do that and people are still confused, maybe go back to the drawing board, keep editing. Mm -hmm. And I thought this time Ebenezer meant Scrooge. That's all. Yeah, sure. <laughs> what does that old guy have to do with this? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Pile of rocks. <laughs> Pile of rocks. Um, it is interesting, like talking about the simplicity versus the, uh, well, not simplicity versus complexity in some mm -hmm. ways, and being too simple is 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 interesting because. Um, my husband and I go through this too. There are some songs that when he listens to them, he'll I can tell when he's excited and he wants to rock with them. Yeah. One reason is because he likes rock. <laughs> the other reason though is because it has something simple like oi or hey or something like that and it just repeats it and he goes, or it's something like um, hey Jesus, hey Jesus, you're my king and it's repetitive. It's back yeah. and forth because yeah. for him, it reminds him of, um, I guess, uh, uh, going into Israel, and he's thinking, you know, how do you think the churches back in Israel led praise? They probably, you know, somebody yelled a phrase, and then the audience responded with a particular phrase. Yeah, call and answer. Uh, yeah, call and answer. That's the word. So, so I know that some of, some of that can also work into, I guess, some simplicity. For sure. Um, and and I think it, and like you said, I think it does go back to the audience. Um, because some audience do, some audiences want the more complex. I'm thinking right now of a church that's, that's released a whole new, or they just recently released an album. Some of their lyrics are very, they draw a picture that has already been written in the Bible. It's already been written, but the way they worded it, it's almost like, oh yeah, like, you know, kind of, you know, we know in the Bible, for example, that, um, you know, God parted the Red Sea for the Israelites to go through. So they use a word, they use the phrase, you turn seas into highways. Yeah. You know, and we know the Bible talks about dry bones, you know, getting um, flesh and muscle and skin and all that. Yeah. And now then they use the words, um, you turn bones, dry bones into armies, you know. So they, they kind of do kind of the one to the other, almost like you turn beauty to ash or from you make beauty out of ashes or things like that. Um, the morning into dancing. Yeah. The morning into dancing, things like that. And, uh, you know, I, I do find that interesting. Like, I don't know if that's considered complex. It's, or it's is that fresh, right? And that's, I think that's the key is not complex. Complexity, you know, there's a place for it. It's not, not bad, not good. Um, but fresh is important. It's important to say things in new ways. I mean, my, my favorite tools for songwriting are a thesaurus and a couple of different translations of the bible right? yeah have an nasb something really literal something that'll get you back closer to the greek and the hebrew and then have the message and have the niv and like go between eugene peterson's beautiful poetry and like fresh eyes and fresh ways of saying things he is a brilliant he's helped worship songwriting more than any of us know we owe a debt of gratitude to Eugene Peterson for the message. Um, but you know, get him online. <laughs> you know, find, find those things uh, and find fresh ways of saying things, you know, and, and don't like rhyming love with blood. Yeah, okay. Okay. <laughs> it's been done, right? Like let's, yeah. let's find something fresh. Let's, and not that there's any untruth there, but mm -hmm. I, so I, my whole, when I did my master's, I talked about prophetic liturgy. So I think songs are liturgies, these habits that shape us, but habits that shape us can actually get dull and they can lose their effectiveness on us. Prophets, the, the prophet's job in the Bible was to say things in, in ways that shook us from our sleep, that showed us the truth of God in fresh ways. So we need to constantly be writing prophetic liturgies. 
songs that shape us, but shape us by speaking truths in ways that shake us, that turn us from our idols and back to God. Um, okay. And we need to do that using fresh words. Absolutely. I feel a blessing coming on. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have church. <laughs> yeah. no, that's really cool. Very, very true. We, um, we just want to remind everybody who's probably watching right now, we are live on Facebook, GMI Hub, and uh, we are in the middle of a uh, GMI Hub live on Facebook. We got Dave Severns, and he is here with us today, and we are doing a topic of church writing music for worship and corporate worship and, and potential uh, involvement of leadership in that role and responsibility. It, uh, it is, a, it is a, um, a, a tough place for some to be in if the church, especially at this time during our COVID, where you're trying to reassess how you're doing what you're doing. And so um, next question, Dave, how about uh, now that you're in this uh, situation of um, streaming or re pre how do you go to the process of doing this now on um, unfolding it to your congregation? Yeah, um, it's tricky. I know different places are doing it differently. We've chose in this season, we're pre-recording stuff um, from our homes, all of us uh, who are involved. And we try to have different pastoral faces up. Uh, so I... I lead some of the time. I've got some great volunteer worship leaders who are also leading, but I kind of coordinate and edit that. Um, so we, yeah, we record from home, uh, put it together, edit together with, you know, pastoral prayer and a little kid's moment and our sermon. And then we premiere it on YouTube is what we're doing. I know people doing it on Facebook or Instagram, also great options. Uh, we find that doing it in one place allows people to log in and comment and get a little more engagement. We're trying to, the, the temptation right now with digital church is to turn it into a really really consumable experience yeah. um, and we believe that church is best when we do it together when when it's an engaged experience when it's something that we um, yeah are a part of I think that's super important so uh, we're trying to do that uh, we're also doing you've probably seen you know songs like the blessing floating around where there's a bunch of different faces so we kind of once a week do a song like that with our worship team members uh, which involves what I do is I take a song I usually put an ear in, play it to click, record it. Uh, I've got a little Pro Tools set up, bounce the audio files, send the audio out to my volunteers, have them play along with it with headphones in, send me back audio and video files, get to editing and just edit audio, edit video, slam it all together. Um, and that, while it's a ton of work, it's kind of 10, maybe 12 hours of work, depending, sometimes a little quicker. Um, the fact that our church can see other people is a huge blessing. Uh, we, we may get to the point pretty quick here where we try to do uh, an outdoor kind of in your car service or do social distancing and live streaming from our building again. We've got a big enough stage we can do some of that. But at this point, we felt like the best thing to model for our people was staying home. So that's what we're doing. You got you hit the nail on the head. We talked about pre-recording it and, and sending. How do you find now being there's that, that there's there, there's that this is you're not actually there. So uh, you're wearing so many hats like you're 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 directing you're leading you're uh, editing you're you know all these things so that skill set is something maybe somebody else might say oh i can't do this yeah so what's an easier or what's a what's what's advice you can give um first of all do the best you can with what you've got mm -hmm. uh you know what like your church needs you mm -hmm. um you're called there if you've got a smartphone, you can record a worship set that will lead your people well. You don't need thousand dollars of microphones and preamps and fancy Pro Tools and Premiere and extra cameras. You know, does it does it add something? Maybe, but actually, you know, in the season we're in, too much of that can take away. Too much overproduction can feel slick, can feel disconnected. Everyone's at home right now. Everyone's living life, it's challenging. That people wanna see each other in our context. If worship is not a performance, which it's not, there's performance aspects to it, but if it's, if it's us bringing back reality to God, if it's us praising God, mm -hmm. do that in a raw and open way. And if that just means you and a guitar, you and a piano, great. If you don't have the ability to add different people, great. Are there other people in your church who can help you with it? Maybe do it, do a song on a Sunday? Fantastic. Um, I would say if you don't, you don't have all of those capabilities to do the audio and the video you can still get pretty far with iMovie and you know iPhone videos it's not going to be perfect it's not going to sound amazing but maybe pick a special moment 
in your church's worship calendar and, and you know, your life? Is there, is there a service coming up? Um, I actually just helped a church that had a 90th anniversary Sunday celebration. And they said, you know, we, we don't know what we can do. And I said, you know, I'd, I'd be willing to give you a hand, help you do some editing, kind of help you coordinate it. I've done it enough. I've got templates. So gave them a hand and, and that church got to see a dozen of their volunteers singing Great is Thy Faithfulness. Oh. Missing, right? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that's the other thing. If, if you're if you're struggling, if you don't know what to do, reach out to some people who you know who are who are doing stuff. Learn. Let's learn from each other. I've reached out to a ton of my friends in this season and just said, "What's working? What's not?" Um, and I've had other people do the same for me. How did you do that video? What does it look like? What's the process? I've got it all written out. If you want to know, I'm glad to send it to you. Um, we're in this together. And I mean, while I'm called to my church, I think the global church, the local church in Canada, is so important. So we're willing to help each other let's let's do it i love that i'm getting some questions here hmm. from the audience um you mentioned about performance versus worship and praise yeah how do you def how do you find define the difference so i think i mean we often we often people often talk about how you know worship isn't a performance and that's true to some extent if you define a performance as something that focuses entirely on the performer. Um, mm -hmm. But I would argue that the best concerts, performances I've been to are ones that create moments that are so much bigger than the people on stage. Mm -hmm. Good songs, good performances point to a truth that is okay. beyond them. If you ever been to a U2 concert, people talk about it being a worshipful experience. Yes. Because they use media, <laughs> music to point to something bigger than the fact that Bono's a great singer and The Edge is a great guitarist. Does it help that they're doing what they do well? Yes, because I don't know them. If I knew, like, my kids play something poorly for me, I love my kids. It's great. I think it's fantastic. If someone who I don't know plays something cor poorly for, for me, you know, if you watch someone perform something poorly, what do you feel? Awkward. It feels bad. So that in that way, I think excellence is important. It helps us engage well. It removes barriers. Um, but I, I think we can learn to, our job as worship leaders, as worship musicians and leading people is to point to these truths and to invite people into this moment, to invite people into this worship of God. Um, so in that way, I think there's a lot of similarities and we shouldn't be afraid of doing things well and kind of using the skill set and the technology to, yeah. to point people rightly to God. They can be barriers and we need to be aware and stop when they are, but let's let's do our best to to explore those truths mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well said well yeah. said <laughs> yeah. wow great conversation we're having here just want to remind everybody we are on facebook live the hub online and if you want to see this video in its entirety maybe you missed some of it you go to the gmi hub tv on youtube and you can see there's a few other videos there from our previous interviews we've had and we're, we're discussing different types of songwriting techniques. We're discussing production side of things. We're, we're discussing many different things with, to do with the arts in the church. And today uh, we are talking about um, the church and music and the arts uh, as far as writing worship songs, maybe corporate uh, worship songs. And uh, we're delving in. We're talking to, to um, our panelists here, Dave Servine. I don't know how to pronounce your last name. Servine? Burns. Burns. Perfect. Dave Servine. So it's great to have him with us as... He is um, a pastor of a local church. And uh, what's the congregation size you have there, Dave? We're about five, 600 on a Sunday, yeah. something like that. Yeah, yeah, pretty cool. Yeah. That's awesome. And, and um, do you have, um, oh, this is one thing I want to ask. Whenever you're in a place where, I, I was in a small church leading worship there, and uh, um, I had to reach out to other churches to <laughs> find talent. Do you, yeah. What would you recommend to um, somebody who's in a small church situation? Trying to build um, their team. Yeah, I mean, take the long view is the first thing. So, I mean, work with who you've got, start there, but take the long view. Find that kid who's interested in music, who maybe is a terrible drummer or a terrible guitarist, and invest in them. Honestly, two or three years of good investment in youth will lead to phenomenal musicians. I've seen it time and time again and been a part of it. You take a youth who's not very good, you invest in them relationally, but also musically. And they're outplaying the 20 year veterans five years later, easy. Um, but it takes five years. So be okay with that. Um, sometimes it's really helpful to, to bring in people from the outside to do some coaching. Um, I, I mean, I've done a bit of seminar work myself, but I also 
make a habit of bringing in other people into our church. Uh, I brought in a wonderful vocal coach, Julie Pearson, who lives out in Calgary. Um, and uh, she, she worked with our musicians and just inspired them to kind of take the next steps. And Julie said some of the stuff I've been saying, but way better. And our people heard it better because guess what? They're used to me, they're probably a little sick of me. They know what I'm going to say. Someone else saying it actually speaks really, really wonderfully. So invest in bringing someone outside in. Yeah, uh, bring, yeah, bring an outside worship leader in on a Sunday morning and have them work with your team or have them bring a team and then work with your team afterwards on a Sunday afternoon. Huge benefit yeah. there. Awesome. There is some, no, there's some wisdom in that. Absolutely. I agree with you. That's fantastic. And, and, and like you say, when someone comes in and says the same thing you've been saying, but it says it in a different way, from a different perspective, and people will hear it again. Maybe they didn't. Yeah. catch it the first time yep but yeah that's great that's yeah. awesome it, and don't be annoyed when all of your team comes back to you and they say man i've never heard this this is so great <laughs> so, i've been saying that for years <laughs> it's okay god gets the glory yes amen so can we summarize let's summarize a few things um one yeah. question i know we didn't actually ask are some mistakes that you probably find in worship songs what are some like three mistakes people make when trying to write songs that they should avoid We've kind of alluded to it, but how about we yeah. kind of summarize those? Okay, so uh, complexity when it comes to rhythms, mm -hmm. um, getting too complex. Complexity when it comes to um, melody. Uh, so not, sorry, like range, is what I'm trying to say, not melody, range. So, so pushing too far on the range. And again, your bass melody and then your improvised after people know it, adding flourishes, different things, right? People know songs, feel free to get, have fun, go into it, but don't start there because people can't follow. Right, uh, right, right. And then the other one would, would just be with lyrics, um, that tension between being familiar and being fresh and that need to say an old truth in a new way. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Yep. Yeah, that's good. That's great. That's great. And, um, and also, even though we haven't really, again, talked about it, the biggest thing is mentorship and invest in youth or invest in people who are interested in songwriting yes up and, coming, yeah, up and coming musicians investing in them and allow for your team to grow and that will benefit them as days go on that's awesome okay. and I, I would also just say it's not only youth youth are great they're the most fertile ground for sure but if you invest in your older musicians and allow them to invest in your youth as well there's so much we can learn from each other and mm -hmm. i mean Older musicians can learn stuff too and, and can often bring such great things and perspectives to the table. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And sources, sources for finding lyrics. You had a whole list of them, but uh, again, they are, I'll let you say them. <laughs> uh, different translations of the Bible and a thesaurus. That's right. Uh, so, you know, the message, like go, go extremes, go really literal, go really poetic, go what most people are reading. So in my context, that's the message, NIV and NASB or something like that. Yep. Awesome. Uh, we did get another question because um, I mentioned about youth. Someone said, how do you deal with youth wanting different music? Yeah, they want to inject their own style of music into the worship. <laughs> um, give some of it to them. Uh, the youth are up and coming. You know, those of us who are mature in issues of preference, and I would say style of music is an issue of preference. We're not talking like a heretical song here. Those of us which, who are mature should make way for those who are less mature, which means sometimes allowing youth to do it. Now, if that's a hard thing in your context, stories and why songs are meaningful to certain people are huge in helping people come along. So I take a song that I know our old people are gonna struggle with melodically or rhythmically, and I have a 16 year old stand on stage and say, this is how this song has helped me in my struggle through anxiety. Guess what? Everyone loves that song because they know that it connects they know it brings people to jesus and actually works the same the other way if i've got old songs and our youth are saying these sound old and lame i say yeah but let's let me tell you a story about how for these people in our congregation it helped them through this terrible time in their lives and the youth then say wow our god is real and he's working throughout the ages um, yeah, so one, stories really help absolutely one of the one of the things that i used to do when i introduced a more of a a more of a youth focused song i'll let the young people do it at their service yeah and allow for them to to enjoy their style of music mm -hmm. and uh, and so that it's uh, something they can still grow from yeah absolutely giving them a place and a context i um, mean you know, our youth do worship and 
uh, so good. You know, often when they come back from a retreat weekend, I'll make a point of saying, what was a meaningful song from this weekend? We're going to include it. And we're going to say, hey, church, thank you for praying for our youth who are away this weekend. This is something that was deeply meaningful for them, which is both a prompt of, hey, I probably should have been praying for our youth who are away this weekend. And like, great, we get to learn a new song together. Very cool. That's awesome. Well, Dave, if... Yeah, go ahead. Just, just saying the last question is going to ask. We wrap in up here. Uh, are you going to ask your to give... Sorry, favorite question? Go ahead, Dale. <laughs> well, no, the, the, just to follow up at the end here, because we're wrapping up. Yeah. Um, wanting to, to, to aspiring songwriters, and they would like to write uh, a worship song. Do, is there something that you would say, look, oh, just this is one thing I just wanted to, to say to you. Give you just a little bit of advice. Connect with someone who's been doing it for longer than you mm. and write with them. Mm, co-writing um, yes co that is so cool so important and i mean i am the songwriter i am today because ken dosso taught me songwriting and invited me in to write with him and then ben reynolds who was producing our album who'd been a successful songwriter said i'm willing to co-write with you and i have been so blessed by that and i've been able to bless other younger people because of that um so find someone who's farther down the road and say hey even can you listen to my song and give me some critique um, that's huge. You will learn so much from that. That's good. That's a good. That's a good one. That is awesome. You know what? We want to thank you so much, Dave. You have given us so much rich, rich information that we can uh, that we can uh, eat. <laughs> you know, just just take it all in. Um, great, great advice. And I love the. I love your heart. Dale's laughing at me. <laughs> I love your heart. Sorry, um, you, you had this, you had this like meat pie thing going on. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, it it is meat and potatoes for for yeah, songwriters, yeah. and you know what? It's something that it's something that it's very real. People love writing music, and they love and people write different contexts of music, and this is one of them. Praise and worship. They want people to engage, and these are such great truths of what we need to do. You know being able to write fresh, being able to, to still speak the truth though, um, mm -hmm. being simple, but not too simple, allowing complexity, but not too complex, repeating all, the, all this stuff is, is great stuff. Well, you know, if you all want to see this again, we're going to repeat this on our YouTube channel, uh, GMI Hub TV. So you'll be able to go there um, and, re and see this, but we want to take, take time to say thank you, Dave, for being with us and sharing your knowledge. Um, Dave is a mentor at heart, so we will definitely be, uh, as I'm, I'm saying this out loud, we'll definitely be putting his website on our, our YouTube channel and our, <laughs> and our, um, and our website so that, uh, if you want to contact him, Dave, you're okay with that, right, Dave? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Find me on social, whatever. Glad to chat. Um, love your heart, Dave, and, and I hope to have you back online uh, with us, uh, in the future maybe as an update to see how things have been going. Maybe we can yeah. kind of swindle you into getting a Christmas song to us. Who knows? See what we can do. <laughs> um, and for our audience, um, I said it already. Thank you so much for being with, with us. We will be back again next Monday with a whole new uh, Hub Online. So we look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you very much for your time tonight. You're awesome. Thank you so much. All right.